Well, good evening. I'm glad you had a wonderful afternoon. I sure did. Got a little nap. Patty got a little nap. And we were able to get by the afternoon without annoying each other too much and uh, enjoyed our time together. We are going to go back uh, tonight uh, over to Malachi chapter 3, if you'd like to turn there. And as you can see up on the screen, we're looking at the Church of Pergamos and the extension of separation failure. It, uh, separation collapsed in its church here. And tonight we're going to be looking at uh, an oxymoron called theological movement. And uh, liberal, within liberalism, there's all kinds of movement. But within biblical Christianity, there is, should not be any movement. There, there, uh, it's a constant. We'll look at that in a little while. But the modern day Billy Balaams uh, would tell us that separation is an unbiblical doctrine. And I've, uh, I've had that issue, uh, you know, with uh, many men today. And they, they say separation shouldn't separate from people. But the example of Scripture that thousands upon thousands will die and go to hell because of this Broadway approach to the things of God. And now that's a Broadway. That's also, way the, also the Hollywood Broadway, which is a way of licentiousness. And that's where it has come to be within evangelical Christianity in most cases. Uh, the evangelical Christian is not really any different than the world in the way he lives and practices and entertains himself. He's very worldly. Look at church history, if you will. What were the times that God blessed the most? Well, that's pretty evident if you read church history. True revival has always come when God's people sought after holiness, not when they compromised for, for, for convenience or for numbers. But seek after God's holiness. And all revivals have come out of that. Real true revival. And that is a constant that we find in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I invite you to stand if you're able. We'll read this text and then we'll have a word of prayer. God says to Malachi, Behold, I will send my messenger, of course, speaking of John the Baptist, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall set as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Now this is the second coming of Christ, not the rapture of the church. And so when he comes at the second coming of Christ, there's not going to be any lost people that are going to go into the kingdom age. Their flesh shall melt from the bones. And he's going to refine the nation of Israel to the place only the saved are going to be there. So he shall set as a refiner, purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years, and will come near to you in judgment, and I'll be swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Now God's uh, being pretty straightforward here. And then he makes this remarkable statement in verse 6. He says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Otherwise the only reason why you're even surviving is because I made a promise to Abraham and I keep my promises. Otherwise, you sons of Jacob, you'd be, you'd be gone. There'd be no Israel. And praise God for his promises. Praise God for his gift of salvation. And we ought to be able to rejoice in that tonight. Father God, as we bow before you, we do rejoice and praise you for the gift of your salvation and the workings and operations of your spirit in our lives for your long-suffering with us, and, Father, for your continual uh, working in our hearts and lives to bring us closer to being like Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Now, the Apostle James, in James 1, verse 16, picks up and makes a very similar statement to what God says through Malachi in Malachi chapter 3. 
So James says in verse 16, he says, Do not err, my brethren, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Everything you have, God has given you, and you don't deserve it. That's what James is saying. And he says, then he describes God with, his, with, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So, theological movement. <laughs> it's kind of a silly thing when we think about it. So those individuals thinking that Christian fundamental, uh, fundamentalism is a movement, I think, of, of, at least to me, have always seemed foolish. You know, they, they say fundamentalism is a movement. Now, fundamentalism is a constant, not a movement. It's a pure sense of meaning. It's simply literal, accurate, strict interpretation with dogmatic applications of the verbally inspired words of God recorded in the 66 books of, of Holy Writ. That's what fundamentalism is. And therefore, Christian fundamentalism is an unchanging constant. There is growth toward the constant and the compromise movement away from the constant but the constant remains unchanging, unmovable, constant. And we have to remember that. Now, if somebody is, is trying to redefine fundamentalism, that is where we're at tonight in the issue of gospel centrism. And we want to look at that. So therefore, a person can be moving towards orthodoxy and the resulting orthopraxy or right practice. Orthodoxy is right doctrine. Orthopraxy is right practice. Or a person can be moving away from orthodoxy and the resulting orthopractice. If you don't have right doctrine, you're not going to have right practice. Now, occasionally you might get right practice without right doctrine. But that's not normal the way it works. But if he is moving, he's not yet arrived at the destination, orthodoxy or orthopraxy, which never moves and never changes. Orthodoxy is a constant. Orthopraxy is a constant. Orthopathy is a constant. So every believer's loyalties are first and foremost to Christ and his word. I don't really much care what other men think of me. Now, occasionally the, the knives in the back might hurt a little bit, but I don't really much care what they think of me. Quite frankly, I don't much care what you think of me. Now, I love you, and uh, I think of you often, but... I'm not up here seeking your approval. I'm up here to persuade you that the word of God is the word of God and that it is an absolute truth. Now, if the local church is going to be the pillar and ground of the truth, that's what Christ said it is, loyalty to Christ and his word must be foremost in every consideration. And before any local church can be the pillar and ground of the truth, that local church must be anchored to its foundations in the doctrine of Christ. Pillars stand upon the foundation, which is Christ. Paul says, I have laid the foundation. Let every man take heed how he build thereupon. Foundation is Christ. So if the, the church is going to be the pillar and ground, it must be built upon the foundation, which is Christ. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25, the Lord Jesus said, And there went out, uh, there went great multitudes with him. Now, uh, we always say, well, wow, he had great crowds following him. And he turned and said unto them, okay, all you people following me, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters and yea, his own life also, he can't be my disciple. How much do you suppose the crowd dwindled after that? See, when you lay down the pattern of what it's really going to cost, what Christ really expects, the crowds and the multitudes dwindle. They always have, they always will. Now let's look at gospel centrism's corruption of separation, how it corrupts unity. Let me be a, a little clear about this because definitions are often... Uh, for, for people who do not study these issues, they become uh, ambiguous. Gospel centrism has more to do with ecclesiastical separation and soft separatism has to do with personal separation and the church and what it allows in, into its uh, practices. 
Ecclesiastical separation has more to do with cooperation between other churches and what is necessary for that. Gospel centrism compromises in the area of what is required to have doctrinal unity before you can have ecclesiastical cooperation between churches. Soft separation, soft separation allows all kinds of practices, music, um, low standards of holiness, or those kinds of things to be allowed in the church to increase the numbers within the church. Soft separatism allows for various reductionism regarding the gospel and various areas of easy prayerism or, or uh, those types of things to come in. This, that's soft separatism. But we're dealing with ecclesiastical separation and gospel centrism. So if you understand the difference, it's important. When Emperor Constantine began to integrate paganism into Christianity with its pagan concept of pagan priesthood, Christians should have emphatically resisted with every ounce of their moral fiber. Some did. Most did not. The majority saw relief from the constant persecution and were willing to accept the progressive levels of integration because their Christianity became easier. And within a few generations, what were once strange aberrations began to become the norm, and the norm became strange. The majority of professing Christians now had established these aberrations, and the norm, normal Christianity, became strange to them. And when you are anchored to the doctrines of Christ, you will quickly begin to drift away. You're not anchored to the doctrines of Christ. You will quickly begin to drift away from the shores of orthodoxy until those shores become foreign to you. You won't recognize them again, and they will seem strange to you. The corruptions of the doctrine of the church and its ordinances were accepted if the doctrine of salvation remained pure. Otherwise, you could have a clergy lady division, you could have Balaamism, you could have fornication, you could have all of this kind of nonsense as long as we kept the gospel pure. Does that sound like familiar to, to modern day uh, new evangelicalism and the emergent church? Now, what their idea of the gospel has radically been corrupted. So, even the gospel of salvation by grace alone can be began to erode then into numerous levels of corruption when the ignorant began to become the teachers in the churches. Now, how many have ever read any books on gospel centrism? Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're totally ignorant of it. Almost every person who's written on gospel centrism are new evangelicals and are neo-orthodox and our sovereign grace in the positions on, God, on the doctrine of salvation. One of those three categories. Actually, it was Karl Barth in his Foundations of Neo-Orthodoxy, or New Orthodoxy. There's no, there's no New Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy has always been the same. So there's no New Orthodoxy. But his New Orthodoxy allowed for a vast array of cooperation within Christianity. And I could spend all night long on that. I won't because it would bore you to death anyway. But the central emphasis here, the Bible doctrine of ecclesiastical purpose and personal separation from false doctrine and worldliness is born out of the doctrine of sanctification. The church must be separated and sanctified and individual believers must be separated from worldliness and sanctified. Both separation and sanctification are intricately connected to the priesthood of all believers. And the central emphasis of both the doctrines of separation and sanctification is purity before God. So God can use you. And this emphasis on, upon purity throughout Scripture is upon two priorities. First of all, purity from worldliness. That is, uh, of course, the issue where soft separatism uh, begins to address. They, some churches can be very strong on uh, areas of uh, moral standards and those kind of things, but then compromise on their music and th these kind of issues and various levels of that. And uh, that's soft separatism. Then ecclesiastical separatism, 
There's all different levels of this. This is purity from false doctrine. At what point do we separate? Now, obviously, we have Brother Clay as a member of our church, and so I'm pretty tolerant. Amen? <laughs> I'm picking on him. We, we pretty much agree on most everything. At least I agree with him. I'm not sure he agrees with me. But uh, uh, not every single thing. We're not talking about unanimity, right? Uh, we, we don't have to agree on every little nuance. I mean, when he gets to heaven, he'll find out I'm right. But uh, uh, until then, we've got to work it out. We have some, some small nuances that uh, we have to work out together and we talk about and discuss. But the, the issues that are, are predominant in, 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 in the uh, Christianity, ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, pneumatology, soteriology, uh, not pneum pneum pneumatology, doctrine of the spirit, and uh, of course uh, the doctrine of salvation, uh, these are the important, really important areas. Now there are detailed fine nuances in them. How about the issues of special gifts, uh, the sign gifts? Shall we agree on that? We have within our Constitution test of fellowship for those kind of things. Otherwise, if you do not agree with our doctrinal statement, we won't support you as a missionary. You won't be a member. You can't be a member of our church. You can attend. Anybody can attend. But you can't be a member of the church. And you can't be in any part of teaching or leadership of the church even then. So in the Old Testament, the word sanctify, translated from the Hebrew word kadash, and the meaning is morally pure, something or someone to hallow the thing or the person before God, to make them usable. In the New Testament, the word sanctify, uh, translated from hagiadzo, uh, it means to, to, to morally purify or make holy for, before, in the eyes of God, otherwise to make them usable. Uh, that's the whole issue. In the Old Testament, sanctification was essential before anyone could serve God or approach his president. I am the Lord, I change not, God says, neither is there variable or shadow of turning with me. Has he changed from the Old Testament to the New? No. He has the same exact standards for us. In the New Testament, within the context of the priesthood of all believers, sanctification is essential to fellowship, a working partnership, workers together with God and his blessings upon any aspect of the believer's ministry. Can't happen without it. So separation from worldliness and false doctrines are essential to this practicum. Therefore, the doctrine of separation and purity in sanctification is established upon three pillars. How many ever milked a cow? Anybody by hand? Just a few of you? Okay. How many of you had a one-legged milk stool? How many had a two-legged milk stool? How many of you had a three-legged milk stool? Yeah, that's the best one, right? Although my grandpa, he made a one-legged belt of, of, of milk stool with a belt around it. And so when he stood up, you know, he poked the cow behind him and it moved over and he went to the next cow. But normally, you need a three-legged milk stool to make it work and be effective. Otherwise, it keeps tipping over on you. And that is true of the three pillars, of course, that are essential uh, to purity and sanctification. What are they? Right doctrine, orthopraxy. I'm sorry, orthodoxy, right doctrine. Uh, orthopraxy, uh, that is how right doctrine fleshes itself out. And then orthopathy, right attitudes. I, I've seen people who might have their doctrine right, and uh, in some cases their, their practice is right, but they have a terrible attitude. Right? You all know some of those. So what motivates them and their emotions? All of these three are essential to being used of God. And so you ought to be invested in your own perfection in all three of these areas of your life. Regularly examine yourselves in these areas. So these three pillars for biblical sanctification are critical in that they define the truth of which the church is the pillar and ground. First Timothy 3.15 and the intent of these three pillars for the purity of truth is to establish the foundations for a pure, a purified, a sanctified local church. And these three pillars for the purity of truth are critical in that they establish the parameters then for 
fellowship with God, workers together with God. You can't have that, and that's why Paul emphasizes it so emphatically in the book of 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So these three pillars for the purity of truth are being attacked today by this gospel centrism. They are taking away doctrinal uh, purity. Otherwise, they, are, they whittle it away. Okay? Uh, I have, have some pillars in my old barn that were tearing down. And uh, you get up uh, uh, above the ground, and these things are solid, eight by eight white oak pillars. And it takes me about uh, 10 minutes to cut through one with a sawzall with a ripping blade. In fact, I got a couple I'm going to cut apart with the, with the chainsaw because they're just, they're too solid. But down at the bottom, I can pull them right off. I hook up my pickup truck and, and put a strap around them and pull it up from underneath it, and the barn comes crashing down to the ground. That's what happens when you whittle at the base of the pillars and ground of the truth. You whittle, whittle away at the doctrines. You whittle away at orthopraxy. You riddle away and say, well, you know, that's okay, and that's okay when it comes to orthopathy. And pretty soon your foundation uh, is still there, which is gospel, but you've whittled away everything else, and it's not solid. And those promoting gospel centrism promote varying degrees of theological reductionism. Otherwise, what is sound doctrine? They seek to reduce the parameters of biblical ecclesiastical separation regarding doctrinal purity to merely gospel purity. And all of these organizations, uh, uh, many of them, uh, of course, are reformed in their salvation, sovereign grace in their positions. And almost every person I've read who promotes gospel centrism is reformed in sovereign grace in their positions on doctrine of salvation. So the gospel centrism that they are centering on is not the Bible gospel uh, that we know of, uh, which is a salvation by choice. Not God's choice, your choice. God has provided you the choice to be saved or to reject him. And uh, that is a choice. Now they hate decisional Christianity. And uh, so they will quickly eradicate you and refer to you as a um, hyper-fundamentalist. That's what I've been called. Because I reject that whole concept of that nonsense of sovereign grace. Now, you better understand what sovereign grace is, that God chooses those who are going to be saved, saves them before they believe, giving them the Holy Spirit, thereby giving them faith and repentance And when they give them the Holy Spirit, at which time sometimes they will not, they will uh, not be able to resist the grace of God and will eventually put their faith in Christ. And that's absolutely stupid. Now, I want to be as kind as I can be uh, without, but that is stupid and totally unbiblical. And I would be called a hyper, -fun I am called a hyper fundamentalist because I reject that nonsense. So the emphasis is upon unity within the ambiguity of an extremely broad definition of Christianity and the church. Now, if your doctrine of the church is local, not local, local, um, you aren't going to be accepted into this crowd. And all I can say to that is hallelujah. I don't want to be accepted in that crowd. Because yeah, they, they have a big church view of Christianity, which is not biblical Christianity. So this reductionism regarding doctrinal agreement is certainly a serious deviation from what the Bible teaches regarding practical sanctification and separation regarding false doctrines. We saw that this morning in just a handful of maybe dozen verses of Scripture, portions of Scripture. So the two priorities for personal and local church of purity along with practical sanctification, are found in Christ's high priestly prayer of John chapter 17. So clearly the emphasis of Christ is detailed in John 17, 11, is that believers might enjoy and be blessed within their unity with the Godhead through practical sanctification and separation from false doctrines and worldliness. Let me explain this to you in very simple terms. Is God holy? Yes. Do I want to have fellowship with God? Do otherwise, do I want to have a working partnership with God 
and be blessed of God? Well, anybody's going to say yes. Well, what's required? Well, what's required is fellowship of God. And so, therefore, my highest priority in life is to take everything out of my life which might then threaten my being filled with the Spirit of God, my abiding in Jesus Christ, or that might grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to get all of those out. That is what Christ is praying for here. Now, Christ says in verse 11, John 7, 17, And now I am no more in the world. This is Jesus Christ talking to the Father, but these are in the world, his apostles. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are, as Jesus and the Father are. That is the unity of the Spirit. We are not seeking to be in unity with one another. That's not my goal. My goal is to be in unity with the, with the Godhead. And my goal as a pastor is to teach you how to be in unity with the Godhead. Now, if we are both in unity with the Godhead, will we be in unity with one another? Say amen. <laughs> that is where it's going to happen. But my goal is not to be in unity with you. But gospel centrism takes that focus out of being in unity with the Godhead and brings it down to being in unity with other people thereby compromising unity with the Godhead. Wow! That seems rather bizarre. So Christ says to this, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. In thy name. Now God's name represents all that God is. A, a name is not just a nomenclature talked on to somebody so you know the difference between one and another. God is one. And he has a name, and he has a number of names in the Bible, but all of his names in the Bible represent the character of who God is. It represents his attributes and who he is as a being. And so when you are kept in his name, you are kept within the doctrines and the, and the issues that represent God. And he says, those that, ha that thou hast given me, gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that's Judah, because he was never saved, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee. Now, now come I to thee. And these things I speak in the world. That they have, uh, might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now joy here is not happiness. Joy is a word that represents rightness with God. And regardless of the circumstances of life. You can have joy if you're right with God. Life can be beaten up on you terrible, but if you know you're right with God, then nothing makes any else, nothing else makes any difference. And that's a priority here. And that's what Christ is, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. How's that happen? Be in the, the right unity with the Godhead. I have given them thy word, and the world hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. By the way, if you have God's word, you're not going to be of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou keepest them from the evil or worldliness. Otherwise, he's praying that God would keep them from worldliness. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This is Satan's system. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. This is doctrinal purity. So he's praying for two things. God keeps them out of worldliness, and secondly, God keeps them doctrinally pure. And as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world for the purposes of redemption. Christ is a redeemer. We are the ambassadors of the redeemer with the message of reconciliation. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through truth. That's doctrinal purity. So Jesus is speaking to the Father on behalf of the church age believers represented in his apostles in this text. He speaks as a shepherd and the high priest of all believers. He does so in that all church age believers are both his sheep and are his believer priests. And every believer priest is under his direct authority and guardianship. In John 17, 12, Jesus declares that he kept his apostles in thy name. Remember what that means. Therefore, Jesus not only prayed for unity, the three pillars among believers, 
Jesus' shepherding ministry of discipleship worked to keep his followers in that unity. And Jesus' work went far beyond the good news of redemption. Jesus' shepherding ministry of discipleship worked to keep his followers in that unity through multiple levels of doctrinal truths. This is the ministry of discipleship and keeping believers in unity with the Godhead then defines the under-shepherd's ministry which it, I, I call pastors Christ sheepdogs. That's really all we are. We're, we're just Christ sheepdogs. We, he, he's the shepherd and we're the under-shepherd. We're his sheepdogs and we're just herding the sheep. How do we do that? Well, with the truth. In guiding and directing them the best that you can uh, leading them to, to come and find pasture. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, it's not an easy minister, but Christ is working. That's why he writes these epistles, these seven epistles of Christ are the angels, the pastors, his sheepdogs, because he, he knows that uh, they are the one that's going to be accountable. So the name of God embodies all the revelation about God in the books of the Bible, and therefore keeping the apostles in the name of God involve shepherding them to live according to the doctrines of truth of the of inspired words of God. <clears throat> Why does God's sheepdogs have to constantly be pleading with the sheep to do what the sheep already know they're supposed to do? Well, you answer that question yourself. I already know the answer. It was through this work of Christ that his apostles, apostles were kept in practice sanctification before God. And it was no easy task. This was essential if they were ever going to be used of God after the death, burial, resurrection, ascension to Jesus Christ. And without this ongoing work of practice, practical sanctification through separation from worldliness, protection from doctrinal corruption, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the church would wither and die because she would be separated from the vine. That's what John 1, or John 15, 1 through 17 talk about. And this is about what the seven epistles of Christ are written in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. It's the Christ who is ministering in the midst of these seven churches, representing all churches. So obviously, biblical separation exists on a twofold plane. There's the top, God, and there's the bottom, believer, priest. God's in heaven, we're on earth. But the connection... Between the two and the empowerment, the direct line, a 220-volt line that's going from God down to you is the sanctification, the operations of the Holy Spirit. Stop blowing the breaker. <laughs> if the believer fails to separate himself from worldliness and doctrinal corruption, God will separate himself from the believer in the sense of fellowship and empowering for ministry. And, and nothing's flowing through the cord. Therefore, gospel centrism's corruption of the doctrine of separation is very dangerous to the church. So this intercessory prayer of Jesus was not limited to the apostles. Jesus' intent in this prayer continues down through the centuries of the church agent to all future believers and the continuation of, of, of the under-shepherd and, and God's sheepdogs throughout the years. So Jesus wanted all believers to be blessed and empowered by unity with the Godhead. And this defines the doctrine of enabling grace. You can't be enabled to do what God wants you to do unless you are totally yielded to God. And that means separation uh, from the world and pursuing doctrinal purity in your life. So the Bible has seven wor several words used to describe this unity with the Godhead. There is abide. There's the word fellowship, unity of the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4, being filled with the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. In John 15, 1 through 8, Christ repeatedly uses the word abide to describe this unity with the Godhead. And in John 15, 2 through 3, Jesus describes the Father's purging of the branches, that's uh, the believer, priest. By comparing the Father's ministry to his own ministry with his disciples, he says, Now are you clean to the word which I have spoken to you? So the, the cleanness is the word that Christ taught was a purification of the corruptions of false doctrines that came through Judaism and, and 
and, and attempted to stay there within Christianity, but Christ purified it. So clearly the emphasis of this statement is upon maintaining doctrinal purity. And therefore purging involves maintaining doctrinal purity, which also defines separation from worldliness. And, and this is clear in his statements from John 17, 20 uh, through 23. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Otherwise, the generations after the apostles, that's you and I, that they all may be one in unity with the Father. Uh, Father, uh, as they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us. That's a unity. Oneness, doctrinal purity, separation from worldliness. Why? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You want the world to take you seriously? Stop living like the devil. And start living for the Lord. Stop playing king on a mountain. And start willing to be a servant. And God says here in verse 22, And the glory which thou givest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. You know what that glory is? That's the Holy Spirit of God. The light that is in within us. We're supposed to let that light shine. He says, I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me and, and as thou hast loved and, and, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You see, I believe Christ's prayer in John 17, 22 is remarkable in its scope. That they may be one even as we are one. Let that sink in for a minute. That's a wow <laughs> concept. But that's your potential. See, all of this is not just that you get your wretched soul saved from that pit of hell, but that you, <laughs> look at this. This ought to make you weep. That they may be one even as we are one. What is the depth of the unity between the Father and the Son? Think about that. Since Jesus is the incarnate Word of God, John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14, 1, and the Father and Son enjoy perfect unity in doctrine, Jesus is God incarnate, the Father, and the Son share in all the attributes of God, mercy and grace and love and wrath and righteousness. And since the Son of God and the Father are eternal in existence, they share the same kind of existence. And therefore, in the triunity of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they enjoy a perfect unity in the three pillars of unity, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, and orthopathy. And that's what we're to pursue. That's what I want more in my life. And every day I study the Bible a little bit more because I want to find out more about what that is so I can remove anything from my life, all of the dross, that everything can be purified When Jesus prayed to the Father for all Christians to have this unity, he was praying for these three pillars of unity. And therefore, if Christians are going to use the word unity, they need to use it in the way Jesus used it in John chapter 17. Stop bannering it about like it means nothing. Because that's what gospel centrism does. They talk about unity without any, with, with total ambiguity, without any definitions of what, it, what it, we are to be unified in. Unity without agreement is not unity. And although the believer will never share the unity of essence that the Godhood enjoys, all other aspects of unity are available to all believers. This unity is defined by the Bible's teaching and practical sanctification, otherwise holiness and spiritual growth. We're growing to that unity. I like what Paul says. He says, I haven't yet arrived. But I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is that? Christ likeness. I, I press towards it. You know what that means? I stretch myself out for it. Many Christians don't ever reach it because they never stretch for it. 
I'm going to close with this tonight. Perhaps the greatest error of neo-Orthodox gospel centrism is the failure to see that separation is intended to keep local churches pure from false doctrine and worldliness. Instead, gospel centrists believe that separation is intended to keep the gospel pure from adulterations. But uniquely, their gospel is adulterated because it's sovereign grace. And sovereign grace is an adulterated form of the gospel. Think about that. And although the gospel should be kept from peer, from adulteration, this is not the only purpose of separation. And I want you to think about that. Now, we've run out of time. We have to have the Lord's Supper tonight before you all get to go home. But I want you to think about this tonight. You are being bombarded on every front that's imaginable today as, as uh, born-again Christians. And the remnant of believers are growing smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think that is the way it will be in the last days. Oh, there are some that project there'll be great revivals in Christianity. No, Laodicea in church is not revival. The Laodicea in church is pretense of false Christianity. That is all of this stuff amalgamating together in what we know today as the emergent church. And it's a mess. It's, we often say we don't even know where to begin. Let me tell you where to begin. Begin with Christ. Forget about everything else and begin with Christ. And when you ask for their testimony, let me hear how you got saved and they give you a testimony. Don't be afraid to say that's not a very good testimony. It doesn't sound to me like you got saved. There are some things that are missing in your testimony. And they want to argue with you. Say, I'm not going to argue with you about it. This is just a fact. You, you can do with it as you please. I love you and I'm going to tell you the truth. But a lot of people who prayed prayer are never going to be saved. And they're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on that day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many not wonderful things in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? And the Lord says, I will, I will say to them, depart from me, you workers of inequity, for I never knew you. It's a tragic day in which we live. When People are their own deceivers. Our Father God, as we bow and close our time together and prepare for the Lord's table, we just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand the importance of these things and fight the good fight of faith, stand fast, and to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to us and has been put in our care. Help us to be responsible and faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.